So welcome everyone to the after show for episode three of the AI Hardware Show 2023. This episode is a bit of a doozy. I think I said that at the beginning of the last one. Not but, to overhype it, but yeah, this is a good one. So joining me is Sally Ward Foxen from EU Times. I'm Ian Cutrus from More Than More. And if you've just come from our episode, welcome. If not, check the links in the video description. This is a more freeform chat about the six AI chip companies that we've just covered in the main show. Many thanks to Untether AI for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in the latest in high performance and high efficiency AI hardware, then stay tuned for more information later this show. And uh, first up here is one company that we're both very familiar with. Absolutely. I think you have to be living under a rock to not have heard of this company. <laughs> So Cerebrus is a unique company in the whole semiconductor industry because they sell chips, they say, as big as your head. As big as a dinner plate. A dinner Certainly plate. as big as my head, yeah. Yeah. So this whole concept of being able to make a chip this big when nobody else can is unique. They've developed IP and they've worked in collaboration with TSMC in order to make this thing. It's super exciting. And I think if you're outside the semiconductor industry, you might not know that there have been attempts to make wafer scale devices over the years that have mm. failed. So to see this one working and working so well, it's yeah. just a real treat, which is why we're so excited. Part of the reason we're so excited about it. So Cerebrus are one of the most well-funded AI yeah. startups out there. I think they're in the region of about 700 million US dollars. Yeah. Um, their current product is the wafer scale engine two which goes into their CS2 product. It's 7 nanometer, 850,000 cores, uh, 24 kilowatts, uh, gigabytes of on-chip memory. And the whole thing is what you'd normally get in, say, a normal GPU. They've actually developed the IP to do the connections to what is another chip yeah. on the wafer. Yeah. And then you may think, well, hang on doesn't every chip have a defect? And the answer is yes, every chip has several. Uh, TSMC's standard defect rate on 7 nanometer is about 40 to 45 defects per wafer, 0 0.07 per square centimeter. Okay. And what Cerebrus does here is they've actually developed a way such that they can route around these defects in hardware, which then get passed onto uh, the compiler. So the compiler knows where the defect cores are for each chip. And away you go. Easy as that. And this chip for AI compute, because when you have so many, so much compute on one without having to go off chip, basically, yeah. you don't have to partition your workload. Absolutely. It makes it much easier for the biggest, biggest networks, right? That we're talking yeah. about for scientific computing and mm -hmm. NLP, uh, so language anything. processing. Nat natural language processing, anything like your big transformers, your GPTs, yep. all that kind of thing. But yeah, scientific computing as well. Uh, anything where you really need that. Yeah. That you, brute force, basically. It's um, it, You're trying to avoid Armdahl's law as much as possible. Yeah. And uh, the whole the whole thing there is how much can you, can you get out of your multi-core performance? And you do that by having very fast core-to-core -core bandwidth. Yeah. And this is kind of, if you keep it all on chip, then you get the benefits therein. So... <laughs> Just don't ask how much it costs. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, how do you get 24 kilowatts or whatever into that? And oh, activate? yeah. Like, don't, uh, don't ask that. Um, you've been around the headquarters, haven't mm -hmm. you? I have. Um, I assume Rebecca showed you around. She did. She did a great job. Um, she's Hi, lovely. Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. You're watching. Um, and, yeah, just the cooling apparatus. Because what, what they sell is a – it's a 15U – system yeah. called the CS or CS2, and you can put three of these in a rack, though you usually only see one, but it's self-contained. Inside, it's liquid-cooled. They've got a special cooling plate, uh, but it's still externally air-cooled, Yeah, and you, you just have 12 4-kilowatt power supplies that you plug in, <laughs> and uh, tw uh, 1,200 gigabit Ethernet ports that you connect in, and the idea is that you just buy a system put it in your data center like that, plug the cables in, and away you go. Uh, I, I did like, speak to Andrew um, recently because they just announced their 16 uh, wave scale engine system, Andromeda, and I asked him, how long between when somebody orders can you deliver 
And he said about 90 days. 90 days, okay. Yeah, which is, which is actually fairly reasonable. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I know for a fact you can't buy, you know, x86 systems with that short Absolutely, lead time yeah. today. So he said he'd much rather it was down to 60 days. Okay. But cost-wise, nobody says anything about cost. No, this. we're talking in the millions though, right? So Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center got a $5 million grant and they purchased two of the first generation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so even if you say, even if they got the supporting infrastructure for free and the software for free, you're still looking at, you're looking at two and a half million for a first gen. This is our best guess. Yeah. This is all the info we have. And that's an academic institution. And sometimes they get discounted compared to commercial. Who knows? So yeah. Yeah, millions. Uh, when when speaking to when speaking to Andrew Feldman, the CEO, they have dozens of customers, right? It's definitely yep. double digits, perhaps approaching mid to double digits at this point. Uh, they've got defense. They've got uh, uh, pharma, companies, pharma companies, energy companies. Yep. Um, so yeah, scientific compute. Basically, it's not. Yeah, it's that kind of enterprise. It's not enterprise that we think of. It's not financial mm -hmm. transactions or something. They're selling revenue. And uh, half the core is uh, SRAM, yep. that sort of thing. And uh, it, it, it does um, mixed precision compute as well. It does. Inside. And I, I actually did a panel recently with Andy Hock, the CTO. Um, and, we, you know, we were talking about all this, you know, what, 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 could we, what could Cerebrus do in the future? Right. They kind of already done it. <laughs> Well, where's the roadmap go from here? Yeah. Where, where, where's the next step function in terms of that development? And again, it's all it's all a case of how do you feed the beast? You know, yeah, because it's only got one point two terabytes of networking. Is that enough? Okay, do they need more? I mean, we'll get on to Tesla Dojo in a bit, where that's actually a big feature. So it's uh, probably looking looking forward to the next gens, probably on five nanometer, and then the next one after that will be on three. Uh, and I, I recently did a video about 450 millimeter wafers, which aren't coming by the way, but they did the research. I asked Andrew, what would you do with that? And he just said, make a bigger chip. <laughs> of course. Right. Why wouldn't you? So uh, coming back to the power, just because I think I should touch upon it. Um, one of the things when you're putting 24 kilowatts through a wafer at one volt, less than one volt, yep. that's 24,000 amps. Yeah, yeah. Thermal density and actual thermal expansion. The uh, either the wafer moving, yeah, 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 or the substrate moving, yeah, or anything else in between. That's a big source of defects. So there's certainly a lot of engineering goes into oh, yeah. the the system as oh, well yeah. as just the the way. I mean, we think the wafer is cool, but the rest of the system is oh, yeah. a massive feat of engineering. It's they have exploded diagrams. I'll probably put one on the screen. I really want to. I want to go back by the headquarters and basically say to to Andrew, to Rebecca, um, or, or, or you know, get Natalia on camera and just say, "Let's take this thing apart. Give me a screwdriver and just do a video on that." I'd watch that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd watch that video. Um, so, from one of the, I would call one of the biggest success stories in the AI industry to the opposite of that. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, um, we did talk about Mythic in the episode. Uh, sadly, uh, we think Mythic has closed its doors uh, in the last few weeks as we're yep. filming this. Yeah, uh, Mythic have been around for a long time, about 10 years. Uh, so they kind of predate AI. Uh, that's how old they are, basically. <laughs> or modern machine learning. Yeah, a deep learning, let's say. Um, but the concept with Mythic is analog compute, which, again, that concept has been around for... Yep. For a long time in the semiconductor industry, but with AI kind of low precision and then matrix mul matrix multiplication, mm -hmm. analog compute looks like a really, low really power. good solution because it's super low power. Mm. You don't need the high precision. You can get away with it basically for inference. Yeah. So yeah, it seems like it seems like a good play. And there are others uh, working on analog compute. It's not yeah. it's mythic's fate isn't necessarily deciding whether analog compute lives or dies. Yeah. Uh, there are other ways to do it, but it seems like Mythic was maybe wrong time, wrong product, wrong niche. Maybe uh, management issues. It's we don't we don't know. We don't it's, know. Yeah. We it, don't know. I mean they, they had a 
product uh, sized for like security cameras, like video yeah. analytics kind of, which uh, there's a tight uh, power envelope in that camera, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason analog compute looks so attractive. But uh, yeah. yeah, I guess it's like, does it work well enough? Does it work accurately enough? Yeah. Uh, can Does a precision actually work? You literally using these flash transistors at different yeah. levels right does it can does it work well enough for the to get the accuracy in the application and we well, don't know also the analog to digital conversion because so that uses the, that uses power yeah <laughs> of course as well um but it uh so the thing with mythic is i remember when they were doing email blasts last year mm -hmm. 18 months ago mm -hmm. because they were trying to draw up excitement for what they were doing and at the time, I wasn't necessarily focusing on the AI industry in my previous role. Um, but I remember that they got a really big, um, a lot of eyeballs because they partnered with the YouTube channel Veritasium uh, in a video that went into analog compute. Now, I have many issues with that video. Um, most of which is... Do we link to it in the description? Yeah, yeah. Um, Go and see what you think. Derek didn't differentiate between training and inference. He spoke mostly about training, but then used Mythic. He spent half the video at Mythic talking about analog compute, which is only really used for inference. Today, yes. Um, you, can, you can't do training in analog, basically. No. It's not precise enough. You need the precision. Um, yeah. You also need... Data, when you're doing training, you use backpropagation. Data flows forwards and backwards. Yeah. Um, so you need the precision going backwards as well. So that any kind of device variability, this is the whole point of digital electronics, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you need that for training. So unfortunately. So e even with a bump by one of the biggest science YouTubers about the concept, I mean, yeah, it's, it's clear that one of the failures of this AI industry is it's so fast paced for so long yeah. yeah, that burnout will inevitably occur. I mean, we we spoke about in the last episode about GraphCore and whether that's the situation for them these days. We can pretty much say it's the situation for Mythic today. Definitely for Mythic. And I, I'm really sad if uh, they really have closed their doors for good and that it means yeah. whatever that means. Uh, I kind of want analog compute to succeed because I think it's a cool concept. You know, I think it's, it's fun. I think there's definitely some play there, but mm. it is tricky to get it working. You need all these calibration and al noise algorithms for the device variability and stuff. So it is very difficult to do a lot in their post, defense. It is very, yeah. very difficult to do. I, yeah. I can see that being sort of like post silicon optimization. Post yeah, exactly. Optimization. Exactly. Um, Cause optical, uh, even uh, optical compute and optical transfer has the same thing. Right. You, if you generate, if you got your waveguides have to be a certain way, and your micro ring oscillators, you have to be able to essentially adjust how they are post manufacturing, so you hone in on your on a wavelength. per chip like basis, yeah, right? On a per chip, yeah. yeah. So it's um, yeah. I think analog compute is still going to be around with us because we see a lot of you know these compute in memory or processing in memory type companies also playing with analog. I think yeah. most people have it on their roadmap. There yes. are a few that are doing some things in analog, but most have it like as the next next phase of the roadmap. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And uh, IBM, which we've mentioned in a previous episode, one of their four pillars is analog, for example, along with the low precision. So, yeah, if, if anybody has a Mythic chip, give us a ring. <laughs> yeah, call us. We want to test it. Oh, no, not even test it. Just, just as a collector's the, item. Just as a collector's <laughs> item. Yeah, okay. I'm a big fan of. Uh, Acquiring cur curios like Intel Canon Lake and um, things like uh, Shaoxin and okay. yeah you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, now that Mythic is dead, dead. Um, yeah, let let I, I wouldn't mind a chip. <laughs> Just say I've got one. Uh, so next on this episode list is is again flipping back and forth um, is the other big wafer scale. Uh, person in the industry and that's tesla i've done a couple of videos at this point already on tesla's dojo uh, they're well worth a watch i was i was glad that enough that i went to ai day at the end of september where they were showing you know updates to their dojo system uh, and dojo you know just a brief quick summary you have the dojo d1 chip you put 25 of those on a wafer 
that's where your wafer scale comes in and then you put 120 wafers into a big supercomputer um each one of each one of the what it's it it's done in a not in a square but in a like three by 40 arrangement taking the reason why and each of the ones on the edge have five dual processor uh, have five dual uh, interface processing cards which have two dedicated unique silicon chips in for delivery with hbm they get routed through a network switch which uses a custom ttpoe that's tech tech potato over ethernet no tesla transport protocol over ethernet to a dedicated tesla uh, network interface card that interfaces with your x86 cpu okay. which they're using amd uh, so the reason why this uh, these are three wide by 40 is that you're actually you're putting data into the system from the sides okay. from your two long edges okay and because of the nature of even the fast on wafer bandwidth and the sort of you know nine terabytes wafer to wafer bandwidth you're still limited that doesn't put enough data into the center wafer okay such that if you have it had four wide it wouldn't be a hundred percent utilization by nature of the data now tesla is in a unique situation right it's it's kind of like what we said with the google tpu in the first episode yes, yeah all they're doing that building that chip for is their own workload so they don't need to worry about you know nearest neighbor security uh, uh nothing they don't even have you know virtual memory addresses because it's all it's all fixed memory addresses because you can define that at compile time and if you want to run multiple workloads on a dojo you have to actually compile it both at the same time right to run it that sort of thing uh people do ask is dojo going to be available to everybody else and my answer is as it stands no yeah but they could just offer a full system Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Elon has said um, it's probably not his focus today, uh, but he has said that uh, they do plan to make it more available to key partners in the future, whether that's this generation or next generation. Um, but there, there, there are lots of really interesting things. I go into my video about how they had a problem with the micro oscillator for the clock because okay. that was actually physically breaking due to vibrations of the power delivery. And all, and all that, but in terms of you know AI, they're doing uh, they're doing quite unique things in mixed precision compute. Yeah. So they have their own hybrid FP8. Um, not only defining that as a quantization level, but you can apply a bias to that of up to uh, is it six uh, thirty two a thirty two bit int bias, which moves your window of accuracy. Okay. Uh, which essentially creates uh, a very wide range that you can actually play with your hybrid FPA values in. Um, Good idea. So it, 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 it's it's doing that trade-off. It means you have essentially two different points of data to define your value and your range yeah. rather than one, but overall it's still less. And if you don't need to define a range, then it's even faster still. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, and, and and they've done this in you know two three years, which is also insane. Um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. The wafer scale element alone is a huge yeah. amount of engineering. Yeah. So I can only imagine. A, a ch chip on wafer is kind of like the wafer on wafer we spoke about yeah. with uh, graph core in the last episode. Yeah, you know, but they're taking known good die. They're having to place them exactly in the right spot. Yeah, yeah. The wafer has active componentry for networking. Uh, you also got to do all your power through that. This again, another twenty kilowatt sort of uh, contraption. I've actually picked the thing up. Okay. Uh, and they said, guess the weight correctly and and win the Cybertruck. And did you? I was off by a very certain <laughs> amount. I I said twenty one kilos. Uh, they said it's nineteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, but that's just one. But that includes the cooling plate as well, and it's yeah, liquid cooled okay. and. Okay. Um, and, and, and then I was asked to leave Tesla AI day by security. And I said, really? And they said, yes. Was that before or after the chip was in your mouth? <laughs> well, 20 seconds later, I was out on the street. So. <laughs> okay.
it, it was a case of I stayed around beyond time anyway, and they were wanting to clear up. And I, I, I had to sign a thing before I went saying, if security asks you to leave, you will leave. Wow. Okay. I mean, it, it was along a bunch of other things. You know, that event wasn't for press or anything. Um, you know, I had a wristband, which meant they weren't supposed to talk to me anyway. <laughs> So this person, do not talk to me. Yeah, well, it's a it's, it's a hiring event, so they want to hire engineers. It's not for I press. See. I see. I had the band that was for press and investors, and obviously, you don't want to tell them anything they shouldn't know. Of course. So yeah, it was a if this if a person with this color wristband approaches you, run away, run away. Yeah, you know, just just like we said in the first episode with Google. Yeah. <laughs> so why do these AI companies not want to talk about their AI hardware? Uh, maybe they worried we'll spill all their secrets and somebody will copy it. I don't know. They they think they think they're ahead. Uh, especially if they only use it internally, I guess. Yeah, they don't need to tell us. They don't no. need to tell anyone. Damn it. I know. It's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts about Dojo are. I think it's an incredible feat of engineering and I really enjoyed your video, but that's about as much as I know about it, to be <laughs> quite frank. I... Uh, I think it's interesting that they have done this mm -hmm. is an interesting thing in itself. Like, why not just use NVIDIA? Was it, was NVIDIA not like, well, what? so uh, they, 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 their whole thing. So the, f the first uh, target for this is with their video labeling. So it's not even training the networks to go into the cars. It's just to label the video for the training to go into the cars. Oh my goodness. You it need a supercomputer to do that. Well, yeah, they said that, uh, with four racks of Dojo, they can replace 72 racks of GPUs. It's pretty impressive. For the same, um, yeah. So th their whole thing is we need to 10x what we already have because we can't keep 10xing how many GPUs we have. Yeah. There just isn't enough space, power. Yeah. And it makes the software hideously complicated. Of course. So just condensing that down. I think they said on their GPUs it takes uh, six hours to label just for the auto labeling six hours to label 30 seconds of video data good grief on their gpus okay wow you so like that yeah yeah uh, because you've got this i mean we've spoken about it before about seg uh, uh segmentation yeah. semantic segmentation you know what's a what's a traffic cone what's a traffic light <laughs> what's a, a person on a bicycle a, yeah and what's a person on a bicycle doing this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And right. and then being able to just having that data labeled on a video is itself arguably the more compute intensive task now at Tesla. Because they've already got the models for self driving and all they're doing now is optimization. Um, you know, whereas some of the other uh self driving companies using AI, we'll, we'll get to mobile eye later in the series. Yeah. Um they're not doing it purely on vision. They have other data to go with. So Yeah, other sensors. Yeah, yeah. So, And this episode is sponsored by Untether AI. Untether AI is at the forefront of energy-centric AI acceleration by providing ultra-efficient, high-performance AI chips, enabling new frontiers in AI applications. By combining the power efficiency of at-memory computation with the robustness of digital processing, Untether AI has developed a groundbreaking new chip architecture for neural net inference that eliminates the data movement bottleneck that costs energy and performance in traditional architectures. Visit www.untether.ai to learn more. Links are in the video description. But yeah, I think between Cerebrus and Tesla, they're the big players. We've covered Mythic, which is a dead player. So... But well, uh, a company we've both spoken to recently, Untether. Yes, uh, data center, but inference, data center inference play, which is there why market? do we need? Is there a market for that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it depends what kind of data center you are, I guess. Right. If you are hyperscaler and a lot of your workload is, is not training, let's say mm. it's doing recommendation or something, or just doing, yeah, online shopping recommendation, something like that, you need a lot of inference, a lot. It, from a general perspective, at least when I'm talking about AI chips, so many people forget about recommendation engines. Right, yeah, okay, it's right. a huge market. Oh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure am half of Amazon's revenue is... How many times have you seen, you've bought this, you may like this? It's not a simple if this, then that. So there are specialized recommendation accelerators, which we'll get to in another episode, I yep. promise. But uh, just, one, just one example of what you might be doing lots of inference on mm. in the data center 
there are others, you know, your Instagram filters or something that yeah. you might be doing is another good example when it's, yeah, it's a lot, basically. <laughs> it's a huge part of the workload. So data center inference accelerators exist. Yeah. Um, and Tether has built an interesting architecture, 1400 risk for risk five cores <laughs> on a chip mixed in with memory, fine level of granularity. Yep. They add with it being risk five, you can add a bunch of instructions of your own for acceleration mm -hmm. and they do funky things too with their number four. It's like, let's invent some new <laughs> number four data types, number formats, FP8 formats, which is all yeah. the rage at the moment. Um, but yeah, they can get very good power efficiency and they even have roadmap down to edge chips. For right. So. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I remember speaking with them. Is, is the guy's name Robert? Um, yeah, Bob, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, just looking at the architecture design, ha where where they have just such tightly coupled memory with compute, the, 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 this idea that if you spend most of your power moving me moving data around, if you don't have you know a base kind of systolic array type thing, then you just need it so closely tightly coupled to save all that power. So they're calling it app memory compute. Until they call it app memory oh. compute, not in memory compute. I hate all these acronyms about uh, I know. in memory. Is it uh, is it PIM? Is it SIM? No. Is it it's IP? App mem it's app memory compute. Is it IPM? Uh, uh, oh, sorry. This is IMC in memory. A oh, app a memory. Am AMC. AMC. Let's say. Is it? Is it that's a, it's yeah. That, that, that's that's that, just what they call it. That's a cinema chain in the US, AMC, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So I mean, the basic concept is the same. Uh, let's yeah. mix in compute and memory very, very close together. Yeah. And that fine level of granularity, let's say, and then yeah, let's save on how we move the data around the chip, and let's let it move through, mm -hmm. like propagate through, um, doing operations on it with the RISC five cores. I think it's yeah, it's an interesting idea and. This is a second gen architecture. Um, so yeah, let's, I'm interested to see where they're going to go with it. I think they already are working with autonomous vehicle companies as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be a thing also. I see. But yeah, for sure, enterprise inference and data hyperscaler inference. I think this is the biggest, I think this is the chip with the most number of risk five cores in the so market. So this is the most I've seen. I've seen another with a thousand. Um, yeah. But 1400 was. Probably the most that I've seen. Forty percent more. Forty percent more. Forty percent yes. more cores. Yeah. Um, the 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 danger is now we're we're saying risk five to a lot of these things, but in reality they're quite different to each other. That's true. Risk yeah. five is there's a lot of a lot of variety within mm. within risk five. But yeah. Yeah, I guess the basic concept is yeah. Let's write our own instructions. Let's have a bit mm -hmm. of customizability. Let's have a bit of flexibility. And yeah, it's not arm. Um, yeah. And uh, well, in this case, they're doing a lot of it is for control rather than compute as well. That's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's, yeah. Risk Five is so popular right now. It's so hot right now. A well, lot of companies using Risk Five in all different kinds of designs. Well, I mean, so on 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 that core side, it's, talking about cores being for control, just to step back to Dojo a bit. Uh, each one of those D1 chips has three hundred eighty cores, but each core runs four threads. Mm -hmm. Two for compute, two for data management. Yeah, yeah, data management's huge. Right, huge so part, so right? it so it kind of right. It, it, compute's only half your battle. And with that, a, with AI for yeah, sure. Yes, yeah. it is. You know, with a lot of the ones we're talking about are lots of memory on chip to save bringing data on and off yeah. the chip. But at this level of granularity, it's about how you move the data around the chip yeah. as well. So as you are going through yeah. your inference, so yeah, yeah, this is these are going to be common themes, I think. <laughs> a lot of the chips we're talking about. So next up in our episode was uh, Tachyum Prodigy. And um, yeah, the minute I mentioned I was going to be speaking about Tachyum, you, your, your face dropped. And, and it, it, it's got to a stage now where Tachyum is a bit of a, it's a bit of a poison chalice word in the industry now, which is unfortunate. It's uh, an interesting story. Um, that they yeah. have where they say, oh, yeah, we can accelerate all different kinds of workloads, not just AI. And to me, yeah. it's not it's not an AI accelerate. Like, it's not. a. Maybe I didn't get it, but yeah. I don't believe that you can accelerate all of the different types of workloads that they're talking about with with one architecture. So it's it's so 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 part of the confusion comes because they did it. Uh, so the person who runs the company uh, CEO is called uh, uh, Radoslav Danilak. 
Uh, if you don't know who he is, he was the CEO of Sandforce before SSDs were a thing. And he essentially, his company built SSDs that actually worked. Uh, he's worked at NVIDIA. He's built 10 gigahertz processors and DSPs before. Yeah, very familiar with high frequency compute, very familiar with dense compute, understands data flow and structure, um, what have you. And he presented in 2018 at Hot Chips, an architecture which promised the earth. Yeah. You know, lots of cores, uh, DDR5, HBM3. Um, basically, it can do what Intel calls scalar, vector, matrix, and spatial. Well, perhaps not the last one, spatial is like FPGA. But all of that all together at once, it will be the killer application for HPC, killer application for AI, and you can scale it up and down. And then the pandemic hit. And a few issues with some of the IP providers hit to the point where there is still legal action ongoing with that. However, this year, or 2022, if you're watching 23 last year, uh, they, re uh, they republished the architecture and it looks very different. Okay. So the f first one that most people see, that most people associate with Tachyum, and this is why we get the reaction we do, is because that was a very long instruction word, VLIW yeah. type of uh, architecture. VLIW hasn't worked in a while in the high com in high performance compute space because with, with VLIW, you have to essentially know all the compute you're doing down to the cycle almost and then pipeline it effi uh, you know, efficiently in order to get your performance because dealing with caches with VLIW is difficult. It's basically, this is what DSPs Yes. Through VLIW, yeah. so yeah. Uh, and GPUs used to use it as well. The new design isn't VLIW; it's something that looks a bit between ARM and x86. So x86 is variable length instructions; ARM is fixed length. What Tachyum does is it does two uh, two sizes of fixed length. Their cores are very much uh, look like more modern cores. They're not supporting HBM anymore. They're supporting DDR5. I mean, it is 16 DDR5 controllers. Okay. Um, and they're still they are still targeting many workloads, HPC and AI. So with 16 DDR5, you get the memory bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, especially as they're supporting DDR5 7200 at the high end. But that high end skew is also 950 watts. Okay. For HPC. Wow. Uh, well, liquid cooling only, obviously. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, they, 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 they will, they, they've uh, showcased a multiple SKU list, uh, and they were meant to be in some of the EU HPC environments, but again, due to this lawsuit with IP providers, they essentially got put back a couple of years. But a couple of year delay at this point. Yeah, can it, it can be a death knell for a few companies? I think so too. Excuse me. So, uh, but I think uh, Tachyum are a lean operation because they're relying on expertise of industry veterans okay uh, and yeah they're licensing in ip that they can use they're also taking advantage of um, artificial intelligence in designing the chips yep. as well which i think at this point you have to yep um, at least at some level and you know uh, they, they do have an fpga platform that they're showing around with okay proof partners. of concept yeah to okay. you know, just show that the architecture works, yeah. and yeah, you know, with FPGAs you can do cycle accurate, you can do power accurate. You can start writing software, and you can start writing yeah. software. So, yeah, well, one of the big question marks I think is the emulation side because they're saying that they want to emulate both x86 and ARM. Okay, which is difficult, especially you know if you want to have minimal overhead. Yeah, okay. I mean we, we we've seen bad translations where your overhead is ninety five percent. So you don't really want that to happen. So they, they, they are promising a lot still. But I've spoken with the guys with ch at Chips and Cheese. We actually had an in, uh, you know, a, a long chat interview Q&A with, with Rado. And uh, we've done a video on that. And uh, that's also up and available going through the Tachyum architecture. Overall, between the three of us in that call, yeah, 2018 Tachyum Prodigy architecture seemed crazy. Caches weren't big enough. Compute wasn't big enough in terms of AI. That seemed like nothing specific to AI. Exactly. This new generation, uh, you know, support for the number format, support for instructions for AI are going to be in built in. 
along with all the HPC stuff. Uh, so that's why I wanted to include it in the series. More confident than we used to be. Okay. Ultimate confidence. Yeah. Jury's still out, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, is it even a little bit late at this point, even if it is better? It's at, 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 so at some level, I think, when we speak to these startup companies especially, they will have a particular customer. You know, a, yeah, a in mind. Customer, yeah. Not, only, not only in mind, but also signed up. Okay. So they design their product focused on that one customer because that's going to be their initial source of revenue. Um, you do get the problem, then it may be too optimized for that one customer such that nobody else wants it and the company dies or gets acquired for a fraction of the cost, which unfortunately is how I think that uh, the open chiplet ecosystem is going to react, but that's a topic for a, another video. But yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, more interesting than not. And I hope it does come to market in some form. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm intrigued uh, to see what they can do. Uh, but based on what we were hearing a couple of years ago, yeah. a little bit before that, it yeah. seems like uh, like unicorns. Well, <laughs> like, it- let's... Uh, it, it, you know, it's it's uh, flying pigs, yeah. basically. It was uh, the story was a little bit difficult to tell at yeah. the time. So, it, it, and so so with that, okay, yes, they they do have a bit of negativity placed on them. Um, yeah, Rajo as a CEO, he's still been very successful. So at the minute, that's where I'm putting some of the eggs in that basket. Okay. So, but I I think it does come down to what size deployments they can make and whether that's going to okay. be valuable. Because I mean. Again, especially in the AI space, if you're competing against NVIDIA, yes, right, you have to also beat NVIDIA pricing. Absolutely, right? yes. It's yep. and if you have to, you have to sell up volume, and you have and to be much, much, much better to get the changeover. Yeah. We're talking about this with the others as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's really going to be tough to do yeah. for anyone, not just for them. So, yeah, good luck. <laughs> and then we we finished the episode with Exmos. Hmm, Exmos. Uh, Exmos is a British company. Uh, You're taking all the British companies. I'm taking all the British companies. I mean, why wouldn't I? Uh, so not a lot of people know that Graphcore was actually spun out of Exmos. I know you were surprised when you we were, were talking about this that earlier. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Exmos has been around since the early 2000s, and they started as an audio processing company. Right. It's uh, small end, kind of IoT kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, but they, once they turned their focus a little bit more to AI, they ended up incubating Graphcore and they spun out Graphcore for the big end and then kept the, the same architecture and applied it to AI at the small end. So, so company wanted to do audio processing, spun out Graphcore, which made 700 mil in funding. And then you're left with the, still the audio processing, yeah. which is a fraction of the. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I guess so. Um, but. Who knows how successful Graphcore is going to be? Exmos is an established company with customers and everything. Right, okay. It's not we're not talking about a startup here really yeah, anymore. Yeah. So it's a different thing. But architecture wise, very interesting, kind of unlike anything else. They have this concept of logical cores where it's like, let's define in software what this core is gonna be for, which is an interesting idea. Isn't that FPGA? Then, no, not that yeah. kind of software. Not that kind of not that kind of program build. Right, okay. The idea is then let's change, let's have a fixed number of cores on the chip, but then let's change whether these cores are doing I.O., whether they're doing DSP in your audio, whether it's doing AI acceleration, which is an attractive prospect if you are building an IoT device and let's say the requirements right. change or you need to uh, add more AI acceleration, you can take some, or mm. it also allows you to um, go into niches different niches with one part yes if you know what i mean to okay, make yeah. niches a bit more economical yeah which so. again kind of sounds like an fpga so 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 if i said cgra coarse grained reconfigurable array yeah no i don't think that's what we've got here either uh-huh. but it's definitely software defined it's definitely all it's more like firmware i think like let's change the firmware and we can change right, what the okay. chip can do I'm imagining a core that can do multiple features, but you need to, you know, flick the switch on the one that you want it to be done for. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah. IO to compute is so very different. It yeah. is. Um, I guess it's uh, there is a certain amount of um, reuse, or I was, what was I going to say? It's more like converting between IO. You need right. a little bit of compute there. Maybe it's like in my mind, there there is some okay. crossover. Right, or, or, or maybe it's like an LED TV where you have RGB 
and then maybe you have a W. Sometimes you want an R, sometimes you want a G. <laughs> okay. But you still、yeah. have to occupy the space for、okay. all of them. Right. I guess so. Maybe. Well, they are focusing on audio applications to start with. Yeah, They've yeah. always been an audio processing company. Yeah.、Um, initially, it's going for things like voice control, IoT kind of voice control.、Mm. Seems、um, to be a fair few of those. Seems to be a few of those around. But it's a slightly different play. It's kind of an interesting play. Uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely works. You know, it definitely.、Uh, we're not talking about、uh, something brand new. Well, it's not a、no. brand new idea. They don't have to、about. prove themselves. They don't have to prove themselves,、yeah. and they're already out there. So, yeah, it's a British success story. Let's say <laughs> British success story. They, they need to promote more. Because if I, I ain't heard them, <laughs> okay, that's probably fair enough. If、yeah. you're watching, do more promotion. Yeah, because, yeah. Because、uh, it's great to hear about these British success stories. Awesome. So, I mean. That's pretty much it to end the、uh, after show talk for episode three.、Uh, we've got many more episodes to come.、Uh, if you're watching this、uh, as they're being、uh, posted in the first part of 2023, stay tuned for next week.、Uh, we'll post a new episode on Monday. If you're just binge watching those, then please head on over to the next episode. But as always, thanks, Sally. Thank you. And catch you on the next one. <laughs>